Now the Commander-in-Chief Clause, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 1, this says the President shall be the Commander-in-Chief of the Militia of the Several States. The President's in charge of the Militia of the Several States. Okay? Um, that, it goes into the Army and to the Navy, and then because it, it says Army, then Navy, and then it goes to Militia. Yeah, and since we're only talking about the Militia, I left, it, I left those out. Good point, though, because that's where they can catch you, huh? If you, well, look, if we're talking about the Constitution, let's read it. That's a long couple sentences that go straight to the militia there. Um, so the, the president is the commander-in-chief of the state militias? Does that make sense? When? When called into the actual service of the United States. And how are they called into the service? By Congress, asking the governor who says yes, and then they're only called into service to do what? Three things. Repel invasions, suppress insurrections, and execute the laws of the Union. Correct. That's why, the, that's why the National Guard isn't the same thing as the militia. So now you finally answered my question, I guess, maybe because now you're saying the National Guard is not the is militia. Not the militia. Okay. No, and we are, we're two slides away from that. So it's quite interesting that these, uh, these clauses, the Constitution, what does it do? It keeps the militia as local as possible. As local as possible. Okay? Even though the militia provides that national defense at a local level, times thousands, right, all across the nation. It keeps as local as possible. And they respond and act and obey the national government only when they choose to. Kind of an interesting concept. And why is that? Jefferson said pretty simply, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Keep the power in the people. Okay? We the people. Okay, here's a slide you've been waiting for. <clears throat> people ask, Wait, the National Guard and the militia, they're the same thing. It's just evolved, right? Well, first of all, like I said, the Militia Act, and it's called, interestingly, the Militia Act of 1903, they created the National Guard. You ask the National Guard and they say, well, we, we're the first armed forces all the way back to 1775. And that's not technically correct. The National Guard was formed in 1903. Let's look at some questions here. And this isn't a disparage of the National Guard by any, by any stretch of the imagination. The National Guard has kind of taken over some of the duties, but they're different. The National Guard is very different from the militia. And we'll see why, at least with seven reasons here. Here they are. The militia is made up of who? All able-bodied men, okay? The National Guard is made up of? Those who enlist, the few who enlist. The militia is organized from? Bottom up. The National Guard from the? Militia, arms are provided by? The citizen, right? The person. The National Guard, the arms are provided by the government. In the militia, the arms are stored at your own home, and the National Guard, they're stored by the government. And the militia, are you deployed abroad? No. Not according to Clause 16, right? And the National Guard, are they deployed abroad? Yes. yes. Number six, found in the Constitution, the militia? Yes. yes. The National Guard, no. Lastly, the militia, does it exist today? Not a well-regulated militia, no. And the National Guard, yes. So in these seven cases, at least, there may be more, but in these seven cases, they're not only different, but they're opposite. So to say the National Guard is the militia is not true. They're different. Okay? Now, if the militia, or my little theory here, if the militia really is supposed to be mandated by the federal government in order to check their power so they can use force at a local level to resist federal tyranny, look at this right-hand side. Government's in charge, top-down. Government stores the arms. They, they control them, send them abroad, etc., etc. No wonder... We like to say, the federal government would like to say the National Guard is the same thing as the militia because the federal government controls the National Guard. They don't control the militia. Interesting. That check and balance. It, it, I don't know how you guys are, but when I, when I read stuff like this and I, and I see these clauses and they're there and someone opens my eyes to them, I go, that Constitution's inspired. They, they got it. This, this isn't just a bunch of old-fashioned words. This is right on. They didn't miss anything. They thought of every little detail. And when you understand the original intent and what this original contract meant, you understood it was all about freedom. It was a great freedom contract. Any questions up to this point? Um, the, the 1903 law, did it outlaw or prohibit the true militia? The yeah, the 1903 law, um, got it right here. The 1903 law basically separated from the 1792 act, and they said, look, we're going to have an organized militia, and we're going to call it the National Guard. And then they said, we're going to have an unorganized militia, which is just still all the people, and they're not organized. They just are kind of there. So that's not prohibited by 
No. No, but it, but it says that if you're not, well, I, I guess it does in, in some ways because it says if you're not part of the National Guard, you're part of the unorganized militia, which really, in my mind, that's the problem. There is no such thing as an unorganized militia in the Constitution. There's a well-regulated militia. It's either well-regulated militia or it's not. You don't call it an unorganized militia because that's just a bunch of people have guns, and we all have guns. It doesn't mean you're part of a well-regulated militia. Okay? Any other questions? What else was in the 1902 law? When I send you, if you put your name and email address, I'll be glad to send it to you. It's a, I don't know. I don't know, but that's, yeah, <laughs> interesting, interesting semantics there too as well, huh? Yeah, but when I send it to you, it's on this slide. The notes are on this slide. It has the whole, well, not the whole thing, but a chunk of it there. Uh, so it wasn't just founding fathers who did it, it was the citizens of all these states that actually reviewed the Constitution and made lots of changes before the final document was approved. That's an interesting commentary. I didn't know. That's cool. So, so no wonder when it says, we the people, it really, it really was literally we the people, it wasn't just these delegates, right? That's, that's cool, I hadn't thought about that. I didn't know about that. That's neat. Okay, so moving on, we're going to talk about like I said, that's maybe 18, 20 slides on the Second Amendment, <laughs> okay? Hopefully we've broken that down enough. Now we're going to talk, where else does the Constitution talk about gun control? Now we all know that the United Nations and their various treaties advocate gun control, right? So what's the Constitution have to say about treaties? Because the UN, that's how they're sneaking in, right, is getting gun control is through these UN treaties. Let's look at this. Article 6 simply says, All treaties made which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. The key clause here is under the authority of the United States. So what about treaties that act outside of the authority of the United States? Well, let's define our terms. What, what's authority of the United States? James Madison said it this way. The federal powers, or the, this, the powers of the United States, right, the federal united whole, will be exercised principally on external objects as war, peace, negotiation, and foreign commerce. The powers reserved to the several states will extend to all the objects which, in the ordinary course of affairs, concerning the lives, liberties, and properties of the people and the internal order, improvement, and prosperity of the state. Okay? So what happens when a treaty exceeds the power of the federal government? The external things. The federal government is in charge of the federal things. It says that right in the Constitution. But they're not in charge of the internal things. When, when, what happens when they start to intrude on the internal affairs of the states? Clearly, they're operati operating outside of the authority of the United States. So go back to Article 6. All treaties made, which shall be made under the authority of the United States, shall be the supreme law of the land. Those that are made outside of the authority of the United States, are they the supreme law of the land? No. Okay? So, treaties are made, to, this is an interesting distinction too, treaties. Why are treaties made? Treaties are made for nations to determine how they're going to treat each other. The treaty is in between these two nations. Right? It's external to both of them. It's their external affairs. Here's how we're going to treat each other. A treaty is not made for one nation to be able to tell, or a group of nations, to be able to tell this nation what they'll do inside their nation. That's not a treaty. Those are called laws. And in the United States, laws are made by Congress, not by the United Nations, not by any treaty. See the difference? It's a huge difference. It's, it's imperative that we understand that, too, how those treaties work out. Now let's look. Does, does the Constitution have anything else to say about treaties? It does. In Article 2, where it's talking about the President's power. Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2, The President shall have power by and with the consent of the Senate, to make treaties provided two-thirds of the senators present concur. But it's still the same issue, isn't it? No matter how much, even if 100% of the Senate concurred and the president wants this treaty to happen, if that treaty is infringing on the internal order and affairs of the states, that treaty is null and void. But this gives us another opportunity to understand the Constitution a little bit better. Quite simply, the only way the Constitution can be changed is by what? A process called amendment. amendment. Okay, for a treaty, all we need is two-thirds of the senators present and the president. That's how you get a treaty. Okay? What about when you want to change the Constitution? How, what, what are the logistics of that in, the, in Article 5? What's it say? How many of the, Repu uh, the House of Representatives? Two-thirds. How many of the senators? Two-thirds. How many of the state conventions? 
three quarters. Does that sound like a harder process, a bigger bar to jump? You bet it does. Because you can only change the Constitution. Like you said earlier, only the people of the United States can change it through their elected representatives and through their state ratification committees. Not in this one, huh? Which, which also leads to a little bit of shenanigans, doesn't it? Well, let's do it during Christmas holidays. Let's do it when, <laughs> hey guys, stay here, right? Yeah, there's, there's a challenge there too, isn't there? But you look at this and say, how do you change the Constitution? Well, the Constitution <laughs> itself tells you in Article 5 by the amendment process, not by a treaty. Oh, what's a treaty do? It lowers the bar to where you just hop right over the thing. All you need is two-thirds of the senators, president, and the president. No, to change the Constitution, only the people through the amendment process can change. You can't change it through a treaty. No, I'm suggesting that treaties don't trump the Constitution. Okay. Treaties are the supreme law of the land when they apply to the, the, under the authority of the United States, which is the external affairs. If they ever go internal, then they, then they do not, they're null and void. They don't trump the Constitution at all. Okay, so if there were a conflict between the Constitution and the treaty, I mean, you, you acknowledge that the Constitution would prevail. Yeah, yeah, but it's not really, a, it's not even for me to acknowledge. The Constitution itself says that. Okay. Yeah, so it's not, it's not an opinion issue. So You're right on. Well, I'm not sure. What, what's your point here that by passing a treaty, sort of by backdoor, and then the Constitution? Correct. Yeah, the point is a treaty, first of all, can't change the Constitution. Okay. A treaty only requires two thirds of the senators and the president. But the Constitution clearly states if you want to change this thing, the only way to change it is through Article 5, which tells you the amendment process. And that requires two thirds of all senators two-thirds of all the House and three-quarters of the states. The only way to change it is through an act of the people. Does that make sense? You can't change it through a treaty, only through an amendment. Correct. But I, mean, I suppose you, you had a treaty in which uh, the U.S. agreed that um, uh, um, people wouldn't go to church anymore. Um, clearly, that's unconstitutional. Correct. So to the extent the government sought to enforce the treaty, Laws implementing the treaty would be struck down. Correct. So there, you acknowledge there's no way that by that by entering into a treaty that constitutional rights can be undermined. That's what I'm saying. Okay, you yep. That. Yes. Okay. Would the people that the federal that the United States federal government made the treaty with, let's say, to Germany, you think Germany understands that that treaty is null and void because they didn't have the authority to dictate what the well, I, I think that's, a, that's exactly the point. It doesn't matter if Germany understands it or not, because the laws they're trying to change in our United States, we're not following. That, that, we don't care if Germans think we should get rid of our guns or stop going to church, etc. That's the whole point, is <laughs> you can't touch our Constitution. The, the Senate can't change the Constitution. The President can't change the Constitution. And you better believe the United Nations can't change the Constitution. Has that principle ever been challenged in the Supreme Court? Um, not that I, well, <laughs> I, I, 